Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Christ is Lord. He is the King of glory. He is the Son of God. Let us worship him in spirit and in truth. Let us worship him in the beauty of his holiness and in the holiness of his beauty. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, who on this day entered the rebellious city that later rejected you as Christ. We confess that we are just as rebellious as was ancient Jerusalem. We often set in our own opinions and we are just as unbending in our ways. Too often our religion is more show than substance and fear threatens our faith. Have mercy upon us and forgive us of all of our sins. Help us in our time of weakness and deliver us from our weariness. Mend our brokenness, calm our anxieties, heal our land, and restore our joy. Save us from the evil that is ever present and guide us in the paths of righteousness for your namesake. Father, protect those who are in danger and give your comfort to all who mourn. Hear the cries of those who are sick and strengthen all those who are suffering and struggling. Create in us a clean heart and renew in us the right spirit so that you will be able to accept our worship and inhabit our praise. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us, mold us, shape us, and make us. Cover us with your mercy and cover us with your grace. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the reading of the Word of God as it comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, reading from the NIV. And it reads this way. As they approached Jerusalem, and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olivet, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village ahead of you, and once you will find there a donkey tied with her coat by her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord has need of them, and he will send them right away goes on to say, And the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the coat and placed their cloaks upon them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowd that went ahead of them and those that followed shouted, Hosanna! to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. I want to share from that passage of scripture from this subject, Palm Sunday in three dimensions. Palm Sunday in three dimensions. 
Palm Sunday marked the beginning of a week that would change the world. A rugged preacher came from Galilee to Jerusalem and set in motion a series of events that would spark a religious movement that still impacts the lives of millions today. All four Gospels provide an account of Palm Sunday, the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And thousands of years later, Christians still reflect on that day when Jesus entered the holy city of Jerusalem for the last time. On this day, we not only remember the Savior's entry into Jerusalem in the past, but we also recognize that on Palm Sunday, Jesus had greater things in mind. He was looking beyond the present. He was envisioning the future. Riding into the city on a donkey, he did not allow the cheers of the crowd to deter him from his journey to the cross. On Palm Sunday, Jesus began his journey into a perfect storm. The New Testament described it in these words. The crowds went wild as he got near. And one writer phrases it in an essay saying it was the moment they had been waiting for. All the old songs came flooding back. They were singing, chanting, cheering, and laughing, rejoicing. At last, their dreams were going to come true, but in the middle of it all, the leader was acting strangely. Christ was not singing. He was in tears. Yes, the crowd's dreams were indeed coming true, but not the dreams of their master. He was in tears. Their dreams were coming true, but not in the way that they had imagined. He was not the king they expected, not the kind of king they were looking forward to. He was not like the kings and monarchs of old who rode into town on their jewel thrones, dispensing their justice and wisdom at a whim, nor was he a great warrior king, the kind of king some wanted. He did not raise an army, and he did not ride into battle at the head of an army. No, he came as the prophet Zechariah had proclaimed, meek and lowly. He was riding on a donkey, and he was weeping. Weeping for the dream that had to die. Weeping for the sword that would pierce his supporters to the core of their souls, weeping for the kingdom that was not coming as well as the kingdom that was about to come. Palm Sunday is a story of contrast, and those contrasts have deep applications for us today. It is the story of the king of king who came as a lowly servant, not in royal robes, but in the clothes of the poor and the humble. Jesus Christ did not come to conquer by force, but rather by love, by mercy, and by grace. His kingdom was not going to be expanded by armies and built upon military might but rather he will be built on humility, love, and service. His goal was not to conquer nations, but to conquer hearts and minds. And his message was one of peace with God and goodwill among men. If we allow him to make a triumphant entry into our hearts, he will guide us so that we will exhibit the qualities of the king that we proclaim. And it will be evident to all that he reigns within us. 
First, let us notice the pageantry of this Palm Sunday parade. A parade that operated without a permit. The Son of God, the King of Kings, entered the city in splendid simplicity. He rode on a borrowed beast. He rode on a borrowed beast. He was the owner of the universe, for the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. But he rode into Jerusalem on a borrowed beast. The ministry of Jesus revolved around a lot of borrowed things. He was born in a borrowed stable, he preached from a borrowed boat, and he was buried in a borrowed tomb. Let us never forget the borroughedness of our situation. Let us never forget the borroughedness of our situation. We are not owners. We are borrowers. We are all living on borrowed time. There's nothing wrong with using borrowed things, but it is imperative to take care of borrowed property. Everything we possess is on loan. Like money borrowed from a bank, God is the lender and he retains the right to call in the loan at any time. We are stewards charged with the responsibility of taking care of the property of the creator. We are stewards, not owners. We do not own anything. Our bodies are borrowed. Maintain them carefully. Knowledge is borrowed. Use it intelligently. Authority is borrowed. Use it sparingly. Possessions are borrowed. Use them sensibly. Time is borrowed. Use it wisely. Life is borrowed. Live life prayerfully. Secondly, let us notice the praise of Palm Sunday. As the procession made its way through the narrow streets of the ancient city, the people waved palms and spread their garments in praise. Shouts of blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, echoed through the city. Some praised him, because of what he had done or what they hoped he would do for them. Others who lie in the streets of Jerusalem that Sunday waved palms for different reasons. Some were political activists who had heard Jesus and had looked forward to him coming and being the kind of military leader they wanted to ignite a revolution that would free Israel from Roman rule. Others had loved ones who were sick. They waved their branches, hoping for physical healing. And still others were merely onlookers, looking for something new, caught up in the passion of the moment, the passion of the crowd. Jesus was the only one in that Palm Sunday parade who knew why and where he was going. He was going to Jerusalem to die. He had a mission. Everyone else had an agenda. Stick a note in that. Christ had a mission. Everyone else had an agenda. It's easy to worship with a hidden agenda. When we think we can bribe God with our puny praise, our worship is distorted. True worship and praise is rooted in an understanding 
of the worthiness of God, the worthiness of Christ, and is not motivated by a desire to manipulate God to do what we want him to do. Now is the time for us to stop giving meaningless praise and start engaging in true worship that translates into powerful, meaningful action. True worship understands that Christ is worthy of praise even when he does not do what we want him to do. Even when he refuses our request, he is still worthy to be praised. Even when things go wrong in our life, he is still worthy to be praised. Even when his mission runs counter to our agenda, he is still worthy to be praised. He is not dependent upon us. We are dependent upon him. If we refuse to offer him the proper praise, the rocks will cry out. His mission cannot be canceled. His purpose cannot be undermined. His destiny was fixed at the dawn of creation and embraces the boundaries of eternity. In the language of the old spiritual, right on, King Jesus, no man can I hinder thee. Men may plot, but God will prevail. No man can I hinder thee. Those who came claim to believe will doubt and others will deny, but no man can I hinder thee. Associates will turn into traitors, but no man can I hinder thee. The palms will wither and the praise will fade. The cries of Hosanna will quickly morph into cries of crucify, but no man can I hinder thee. Yes, the cross awaits and crucifixion will come, but no man can I hinder thee, for death cannot defeat the majestic Christ and the grave cannot hold the king of kings. No man can hinder him. Finally, let us consider the prayer that was within the Palm Sunday praise. The text records that people cried, Hosanna, Hosanna to the highest, Hosanna to him that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. Hosanna is a term that's often confused with hallelujah. Hallelujah is a proclamation of praise. Translates means God be praised. But Hosanna is also a plea for salvation. Hallelujah is an exclamation of praise. Hosanna is a plea for salvation. The Hebrew meaning of the root word Hosanna Hosanna is, I beg you to save, please deliver us, or save us now. So when the people cried out, Hosanna, they were not only acknowledging the Messiahship, the kingship of the Lord, but they were also pleading with him, save us now. That same cry, needs to be raised today. That cry acknowledges who Jesus is. He is the Christ. Hosanna, save us now. He is the promised Messiah. Malachi's refiner, Job's war horse, Ezekiel's wheel. He is the promised Messiah. Hosanna, save us now. He is the one who came to deliver us from the penalty of sin and fulfill the covenant promise in Genesis that the seed of woman would bruise the heel head of the serpent. He is the Christ. Hosanna, save us now. Save us from injury, 
and isolation. Save us now. Save us from the evil inflicted by others. Hosanna, save us now. Save us from the harm we inflict on others. Hosanna, save us now from the harm we inflict upon ourselves. Hosanna, save us now from economic ruin. Hosanna, save us now from bigotry and intolerance. We stand in need of a savior who can renew our hopes and transform our minds. We stand in need of redemption. We need to be restored. We need him now. Hosanna, save us now. Christ came to be the Savior. It was implied and stated explicitly at the time of his birth that you would call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Yes, we need to cry out, Hosanna. We need to acknowledge that we stand in need of divine intervention, we need a savior. We need him today. We need him now. We need him every hour. Save us now and we will be saved. Save us now and we will be secure. Thou art the Christ. Thou art the redeemer. Thou art the one who is mighty to save. And a hawks wrote some words in the 1870s that captured the sentiment raised on that first Palm Sunday morning. She wrote, I need thee every hour. Most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee every hour stay thou nearby temptation lose thy power when thou art nigh i need thee every hour in joy and pain come quickly and abide or life is vain in a world torn by war we need the prince of peace in a time when death is raging, we need the one who declared that he was the resurrection and the life. We need the sovereign of life who took the sting from death and robbed the grave of the victory. We need him who died on Calvary but rose triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. We need a savior. In times like these, when violence is rampant and indifferent has led to apathy even within the household of faith, we need to cry out, Hosanna, save us now. Cry out with Anna Hawkins, I need thee every hour. Teach me thy will and thy rich promises in me fulfill. I need thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me thine indeed, thy blessed son. I need thee. Oh, I need thee every hour. I need thee, oh, bless me. Oh, bless me now, my savior. I come to thee, we come before him in our weariness, in our weakness, knowing that he and he alone can give us strength in any situation. For he is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the only one who can save us now. And may his grace and his peace be with you. May his promises sustain you and may his presence strengthen you now and forever. Amen and amen. Be encouraged, be inspired, and be blessed.